You are welcome to the GMAX 41's Ordinary Differential Equation class. In this video, we are going to look at the second order ordinary differential equation, SODI. You will recall that in previous classes, we've treated FODI, first order ordinary differential equation, for which, of course, we encounter different types of it and we apply the method that is peculiar to a particular type of first order ordinary differential equation and obtain the solution of that first order differential equation. Now we want to move on to second order ordinary differential equation, which is one in which the dependent variable, or because in most cases we use y to represent the dependent variable, you know, have been differentiated twice with respect to the independent variable, which in most cases you see as x. The dependent variable, which is y, that has been differentiated twice, is written in this order. You can see that d2y d squared x. So this shows that the dependent variable y has been differentiated two times with respect to the independent variable x. Generally, a second order ordinary differential equation is given by what we have on the board here. a d2y d squared x plus b dy dx plus c y equal to f of x. This is the general representation of second order ordinary differential equation SODI. Now, we have types of second order ODE. A second order ordinary differential equation could be homogeneous SODI or it could be non homogeneous SODI. It is homogeneous when this fx is equal to zero and then the equation will look like this. You can see a d2y d squared x plus b dy dx plus cy equal to zero. You notice here that in this part where you have cy. This y is the variable. It was not differentiated at this point. Coming here, this is the first derivative. Of course, it's bearing its coefficient, b, and then this is the second derivative of the dependent variable y, you know, bearing the coefficient a. So when it is equal to zero, we refer to it as the homogeneous second order ordinary differential equation. What if f of x is not equal to zero? It's not equal to zero. What if it is just some kind of function, all right? It could be a constant, which is not zero. Something like one, five, minus three, you know? It could be a function of x itself, okay? Maybe say a polynomial function. It could be a trigonometric function. It could be an exponential function. So in the case where f of x is not equal to zero, then we refer to that SODI as a non homogeneous SODI. Second order ordinary differential equation, non homogeneous. We are going to deal with the homogeneous second order ordinary differential equation in this class. So, come along with me, let us look at the concept of homogeneous SODI. Already we've stated that the second order ordinary differential equation is written in this form. Is that so? And how do we obtain the solution of uh, a second order ordinary differential equation, the homogeneous type? It might interest you that this simply depends on your ability to solve a quadratic equation. Usually we can think of using factorization method if that quadratic equation generated from this survey can be factorized. Or we can think of using the completing the square method. All right, if the um, quadratic equation obtained from this survey cannot be factorized. So what are we trying to say in essence here? To get the solution of a homogeneous second order ordinary differential equation, the, the solution is also known as complementary function. To obtain it actually depends on the solution of the quadratic equation you're going to obtain from that homogeneous survey. The quadratic equation is known as auxiliary equation. Look at it. This auxiliary equation is obtained from here. A, A, which is the equation of the second order derivative of y. 
this n possibly represent the derivative. Are you following? Now you can see raised to the power 2 telling you all the 2. And then plus b, look at the b times m raised to the power 1. Power 1 because this is first order derivative. Then plus c. Plus c. This term is not bearing any derivative. You know that, right? So even if you fix m here, we could say m raised to power 0, which will still give you 1. You know that, right? And 1 times c. So in this part, at this point, you just pick your c there, which is a constant. And you make it equal to zero. This is known as the auxiliary equation because you see it is a quadratic equation. So when you solve this quadratic equation, you obtain what we call the root of the equation. You know about that, right? And of course, the root of the equation will now determine the solution of the homogeneous solder that is given to you. Five different types of solution have been identified for a problem involving homogeneous solid. In the next video, we're going to see these types of solution, which are dependent on the root of the auxiliary equation that you obtain from that homogeneous solid. In this video, we now want to look at the complementary function. That's the solution to homogeneous solid. You will recall that in the previous video, I stated that the solution depends on the type of root of the auxiliary equation you obtain. Is that not so? So when you solve the quadratic equation, the root of the equation you're going to get there will determine the solution of that homogeneous sodium. And that's why on the board here we've got five solutions that you have to get to know about. Although these equations are these uh, complementary functions otherwise known as solutions 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are derived. Alright? However, we've chosen to just pick these solutions. When problems are given to you, all you need to do is solve the auxiliary equation for that homogeneous study and then pick the solution that applies to it from here. Fix in the value of the root of that auxiliary equation you obtained, and that's all. Is that okay? So we've written these equations or these solutions on the board without derivation. When problems are given to you, you don't really bother yourself deriving them. Is that okay? Go straight ahead and solve the homogeneous study and then pick the solution that applies it. Now, how do we know the solution that applies to a particular root Particular zeros of the quadratic equation, you know, of the auxiliary equation that we obtained. You solve a problem, you get rid of the auxiliary equation. How would you know the solution that applies to it here? That's what we now want to learn. Are you ready? All right, fellow Lang, let us look at the first solution here. Now, when the auxiliary equation is of this form, a n squared plus b n plus c equal to zero. You can take it. That is to say that it contains possibly all the three terms. All the three terms. Or, let's say the first other derivative term and the second other derivative term. But that is in the case of this first solution anyway. But just let's look at it generally. If this is the auxiliary equation, so it contains the three terms in quadratic equation, that's the square term, the raised to power 1 term and the constant term. And then you solve that quadratic equation, that is the auxiliary equation. You're going to get the root of the equation m1, m2. Now, if m1 and m2 are real numbers, real numbers, and their values are not equal, that is to say that m1 and m2 have different values, the solution that applies to that is this solution. So what do you do? Once you get the value of m1 and m2 from this auxiliary equation, simply copy this solution and substitute for what? m1 and m2. a and b are the constants of integration, which can be obtained for a given IVP situation, that is initial value problem situation. Is that okay? Alright, take note. For us to use this Solution. It means that this auxiliary equation must be factorizable. Please put that down because I didn't write it on the board here. 
this solution applies when the auxiliary equation is a factorizable quadratic equation such that the roots of the equation m1 and m2 are real numbers and they are not equal. Let's move on to the second solution. This, where we have y equal to a plus bx times exponential mx. Of course, you can still write it as ax plus b. It's not uh, compulsory that it is b that must bear x. No, a can also bear it, so it can be of this form. ax plus b in bracket times exponential mx. When do you use this complementary function, this solution? You use it if, on solving this auxiliary equation, you obtain real roots. That is, the roots of the equation are real numbers, and they are equal. That is to say, m1 is equal to m2. In that case, you can simply use m to represent it. I follow that to represent the root of the equation. Hence, this is the solution that goes for it. All you need to do is to copy this solution and then substitute for m, which is the root you obtain from solving this auxiliary equation. I hope you're following. Once again, this solution is used when the quadratic equation, that is the auxiliary equation here, is factorizing. Put this down as well too. All right. This second solution is also used when the auxiliary equation is factorizable. And of course, you get the root of the equation to be real numbers such that the roots m1 and m2 are the same. Let us now move on to the third solution. All right. Uh, this solution is actually used when the auxiliary equation cannot be factorized. In that case, you'll be thinking of using the completing the square method, or of course, you can use the quadratic formula. Is that okay? Put that down. This solution comes in when the auxiliary equation cannot be factorized. In that case, you either use completing the square method or you can use the quadratic formula. In what case do we use this solution number three, this complementary function? It happens when m1 and m2, that's the root of the equation, are imaginary roots. Is that okay? You know what we refer to as imaginary number, right? Get it. Usually, the discriminant part of the quadratic formula, that part that has square root of b squared minus 4ac, that part will give you a negative number inside the square root. And once you have that negative number, of course, you know you're going to get imaginary roots. They wouldn't be real numbers as your root. I follow you, get imaginary root. And generally, the root of the equation is given as this m equal to alpha plus minus i beta. This alpha is the real part of the root. Are you following, right? And then this ib is the imaginary part. Of course, you know in the study of complex numbers, z equal to x plus iy. A complex number which is imaginary contains a real part and what an imaginary part. The fact that there is an imaginary part makes the whole thing a complex number. Is that okay? So, in a situation like that, you know that what you're going to use as the complementary solution of function is this equation 3. This and this are the same thing. Is that okay? I just uh, wrote them in these two forms to tell you that any one of them could carry a constant of integration there, A or B. Is that okay? Now, on solving this, you will get a solution that looks like this. Alpha plus minus I beta. So, substitute for alpha here and substitute for beta. Is that okay? And that would be the solution. Now let us look at the complementary function number four type. Is that okay? These solutions are used in a case where b is equal to zero. Of course, you know if b is equal to zero, this term will reduce to just two terms: a m squared plus c. Of course, this could also be minus. You know that we have plus plus. It doesn't mean that when questions are given, all you're going to see there is plus. You can see minus as well too. And that is why in this case I've decided to use plus or minus. So equal to zero. How do we handle that? All you need to do is divide through by the equation of m squared. If you do that, this is what you're going to get. Are you following? And then if we call c over a, if we represent it with n squared, you notice that the auxiliary equation will now be m squared plus n squared equal to zero. If you solve this auxiliary equation to get the value of n, which is the root of the equation, this is what you're going to get. Are you following? Because if this n squared goes over there, it will become minus n squared on the right hand side. To get n now, you'll be taking square root of minus n squared. And you know that square root of a negative number, just like I explained regarding the discriminant part, square root b squared minus 4ac of our quadratic 
um, um, formula, right? The almighty formula, some persons call it that way. If you do that, as long as you're enclosing a negative term with square roots, you're going to get imaginary number. And that is the concept of this imaginary here, I. So you're going to get IN as a solution of that problem. That I represents imaginary, just like you have it in this case. When that happens, the solution to that differential equation, second order, I told you, right, is going to be A cos NX plus B sin NX. Take care of this on this exponential, alpha X. A cos beta X plus B sin beta X. Or you can still write it as A sin beta X plus B cos beta X. This solution 4 was actually obtained from solution 3. Take note. The only thing that happened here is that this solution 4, the root of the equation does not have a real part. It doesn't have the alpha part. Are you getting it? No alpha. So if there is no alpha, it means that alpha is 0 here. If you fix in 0, exponential 0 times x will give you 1. So 1 times this bracket maintains that bracket for you. Now the last of the solution you need to know is when you're dealing with a m squared minus c y or zero, you can see that. So I've quickly divided through by a to have it like this. Then c over a, if we call it n squared, pick out the auxiliary equation and solve. The auxiliary equation will be m squared minus n squared or zero. If this minus n squared goes over there, it will be plus n squared. And then you take square root of both sides. Square root of a positive number will still give you positive, not negative. So there's nothing like imaginary number there. Is that okay? And once you're done with that, you now have that n is equal to n. So n will now be the root of that equation as the solution of n. If you do that, the complementary function, the solution to the homogeneous sodium of this type is given by this equation 5. y is equal to a cos nx plus b shine nx. Don't forget, you can actually also write it as a shine nx plus b cos Nx. This is a hyperbolic solution. Is that okay? Hyperbolic function solution. So that is all about the complementary function, the solution to a homogeneous sodium. In the next video, we're going to pick questions to solve and see how we apply this solution that have been written on the board.